We're going to continue this talking about um, the World Food Program. So let me. Okay. Thank you. I'll get going. Um, okay. Um, our next guest is Michael Dunfor. He is the regional director of the World Food Program's East Africa Bureau. Um, he oversees a staff of over 6,000 people. And to give you a sense of what a behemoth the World Food Program is in East Africa, he oversees a, a budget of $6.9 billion. So I guess that also involves a lot of the aircraft and stuff you guys do with all the logistics, which is very expensive. Um, in any event, um, we're going to talk about East Africa, but I'm going to start the conversation with a question about Ukraine and the war in Ukraine. Um, a, a lot of us have followed that the UN, sort of one of its biggest achievements in the war was negotiating the Black Sea grain deal, which allowed the export of, um, of, of grains out of Ukraine, uh, the breadbasket of the world, for, particularly for many countries in the Middle East, Africa, and elsewhere. And that has gone, initially has gone quite well. Um, there is another piece to the deal, which in call, it involves helping the Russians export and get around sanctions for the export of fertilizer. Um, they have never reached a deal on that, and so that is like an open question, and there's some concern that over time that they might jeopardize this essential program. So I want to get a sense of in East Africa, which is ground zero for a lot of the issues that we're focusing on, uh, drought, um, climate, um, you know, is that still, you know, is it impacting? Is it sort of adding to sort of the struggles that are already, you already see in the region? Thanks very much, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, the Black Sea Initiative, we consider to be a good deal. Um, already since that deal was signed, 25 million metric tons of wheat has been exported from Ukraine. WFP itself has imported over 500,000 metric tons. So. When it comes to just the availability and access to grains, very positive. The recent renewal of the deal, very positive, and we saw that in, reflected in the markets. We saw a decrease in the commodity prices as soon as that deal was signed. And that primarily, in addition to the availability of stock and commodity, is a key success. It is normalizing, to an extent, world commodity markets. and we had seen when there was doubt as to whether or not that deal would succeed an increase and that increase has been in place ever since 2021 um, there are four key drivers when it relates to food insecurity in the region at the moment it's conflict it's climate it's the effects of COVID, and it's this dramatic increase in costs so the fact that the deal has been extended very positive you rightly talk about the lack of fertilizer that is being mobilized. And this does cause real concerns for us in Africa because so much, as you indicated, is, a, is being sourced from Russia and Belarus, the two countries affected by the sanctions. We are concerned that if that fertilizer is not available, the yields this year will be reduced. That in turn will increase the cost of commodity and that in turn will drive food insecurity. Uh, to give you a sense, in the US or the UK where you're from, Australia where I'm from, typically a household spends about 10% of their income to meet their monthly food needs. In the Horn of Africa, that figure is anywhere between 40, 50, up to 60%. So any increases in cost really has a dramatic impact in the ability of parents to put food on the table. Right. And yet, even with, you know, if you take Russia and fertilizer off the table, um, that region is still facing massive problems with food security, drought, Somalia, expectation of, uh, of a declaration of famine. Um, can you talk a bit more about some of those drivers and, and why there's so much pressure on that region? Um, is it largely being driven by climate? You also have the other issues of not only conflict in Ukraine, but conflict, you know, uh, until recently in 
Ethiopia, in South Sudan, in Somalia, ongoing conflict. So if you could talk about sort of the interplay and inter interplay of all these different forces and why it makes it so difficult. Well, it makes it difficult on lots of different levels. And as you say, it's conflict and climate which are the primary drivers and then that hangover from COVID as well, where economies were smashed, uh, sectors written off and only now starting to get back on their feet. Um, climate, let's start with climate. We are facing the worst drought in over 60 years in the Horn at the moment, affecting upwards of 23 million people. Huge numbers. And yes, we are facing the risk of a famine in Somalia. We probably are facing the risk of a famine equally in Ethiopia, uh, just because of the scale. We have to date been able to keep it at bay, and that's a very positive thing. But the key is that we're going into 23, we're well now into it, the worst is not behind us. In fact, I fear that the worst is still ahead of us because it will be difficult to sustain the level of support and funding that has covered the costs of this massive scale up. Um, we actually have some very interesting data, some analysis the World Food Program has recently concluded. It's looking at the three droughts in Somalia over the course of the last 10 to 12 years. In 2011, we were in famine after just two failed rainy seasons. 260,000 people died as a result of that famine. Fast forward to 21, now to 23, five failed rainy seasons. We're coming into the sixth, which is likely also to underperform. We're not yet at famine. So it's allowed us to go back and look at what has changed over the course of that decade. First and foremost, we've learnt the lessons. There are early warning systems in place. We've invested in resilience. The government has invested in social protection systems. The World Food Programme has pivoted from an in-kind to a cash-based response. Most importantly, we were able to upscale our operations enormously from about 1.5 to 4.5 million people over the course of six months, primarily funded by the US government. And you'll recall, Colm, that last year there was the Ukrainian supplemental, huge amounts of additional funding made available. The big fear that we at the World Food Program have, and it's a fear sh uh, shared by many, is that we will not have those same levels of funding to be able to maintain the level of response. Well, well, I know your time is tight, but I just have one last question. Um, you talk about the issue of famine, and it's always seen as sort of a trigger of, you know, when you reach the level of declaring famine, that's when the problem, you know, be catches the imagination of the world. Or, uh, and, and so, but the question is, people are already dying of hunger, no? And so why is it difficult mobilizing international support for responding before you've pulled that trigger? Well, fortunately, this time around, we have managed to get the levels of funding needed to scale up to the extent required thus far. And avoiding a famine is a sign of success. Right. But success today will not be success tomorrow if we allow the situation to deteriorate. So it is going to require sustained levels of funding and sustained mobilization, not only by the World Food Program, but by the UN, by the NGO sector, and all concerned in trying to keep that famine at bay. Great. Well, thank you. I could go on for a while, but I know Michael has another meeting immediately after this, so I will, I will relieve you of your duties. Thanks very much, Colin. Thanks very thank much so for much. being here. Thank you.